floor to everyone. So or I can start, please. Oops. Wait, Isabel, you are. So. Um. So the first person to be Alexander. So Alexander, go ahead. You are the host of this book first. Go. Alexandre? Ah, hello. May I? You as the first one, yes. So, dear Vice Rector Claudio Cavadas, dear editors and authors, dear all. As Director of Coimbra University Press, I have the pleasure and the honor to present uh, the book Excellence in Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, Institutional Policies, Research and Practices in Europe edited by professors Isabel Lue from Open University, Teresa Pessoa and Fatima Sol from Coimbra University. This book addresses the state of the art concerning teaching and learning, as well as research methods in Europe, gathering contributions from university professors all over Europe, from Portugal to the United Kingdom, Ireland, Sweden, Netherlands, Spain, Italy, and Czech Republic. The book provides very important contributions on policy and quality, professionalization of teaching and academic development, relationship between research and teaching, as well as pedagogical practices. With this book, the Coimbra, Coimbra University Press provides a, a great uh, and excellent contribution on teaching, learning and research in the European context. My warmest congratulations and thanks to the other th editors and to the contributors. Kind regards. Okay, thank you, thank you, Shen. So I think it's now, it's my turn, Isabel. So, uh, so first of all, welcome to the University of Coimbra, even it's like that, all the colleagues that come from outside. And uh, of course, acknowledge uh, Shen, so director of Coimbra University Press, for the introduction and all the colleagues that uh, are doing, so put this book together and put us together also for the University of Quima. So I'm vice rector for research. I'm also the director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Research that try to bring different uh, 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 investigators together to talk about uh, things that we like. And also I am in the, at the University of Coimbra, we have a, a strategic project related to pedagogic innovation. And this is so, uh, and I'm very uh, committed also to promote internationalization in research. So with this book, I put everything together. So the only thing in for, for sure, friendship between you that you know from for a long time. So with the one book, we can have everything together, the best things that we have at university. Uh, so cl promoting collaboration, promoting research, promoting the link between research and teaching. So this is really a key important thing at universities, all of us. Uh, so, and of course, collaboration and friendship. So it's really very good to be here with, with you and to promote this, uh, the launch of this so relevant book. Um, and so, and acknowledge the three colleagues and all of you that participate in the book. Hope that, hoping that uh, next year you can be here in presence in, the, in Coimbra. So this is my, I, I will promote that meeting here. Uh, that will be very, very good. Fortunately, the, the weather here is not so good today, so it's not so sad. Uh, so in a lot, uh, and also, thank you, Leslie, for being with us and to, 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 to be ready to, to talk with us. So we are very enthusiastic with this book. So as you can see, I'm very enthusiastic with this book. So, uh, so we welcome again. So now, Isabel and colleagues, so the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, good afternoon. 
dear colleagues and friends. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. It is a great pleasure to have the chance to share with you the first steps of this journey, because it has been a long journey, one that we as editors have enjoyed since day one. Initially, we planned to organize a face-to-face -face seminar uh, so we could meet the authors and create an opportunity for networking with other colleagues. It was supposed to be a social event, as Claudia mentioned, but unfortunately, it seems this is the new reality and we need to meet at a distance. It's not the same thing as meeting face to face, but at least it will allow us to value the work we have done and share it with others. On behalf of the editors, Teresa Pessoa, Fatima Sol and myself, we would like to say a few words of appreciation for those who helped us to make this book possible because we couldn't have done this alone. The first thank you goes to all the authors who dedicated their time to write the chapters. It has been a great experience working with you all. To the Coimbra University Press for supporting this project since the beginning. To the reviewers who did an amazing job reading and providing feedback to the authors because we were able to improve the chapters. To the vice rector, Claudia Cavadas, for organizing this event. And lastly, a special thank you to Leslie Jane Eels Reynolds for not only writing the book introduction and presenting the book here today, but also for our initial support and enthusiasm. A brief context. I think it's important to provide you with this brief context so you can understand how this idea emerged. What was the, the initial idea behind the book? So everything started when my colleagues, Teresa uh, and Fatima, visited my previous institution where I worked with Leslie Chain in England. And that was back in 2017. After a few months, we also visited Coimbra University. And during these institutional visits, we talked about the differences and similarities in teaching, learning and assessment and also about the culture of teaching quality and professional development in Portugal and in England. We discussed how the national and institutional policies shape the way we work and how our students learn, and realized that we could bring some academics together to write and reflect on how policies influence the way institutions and staff operate in higher education, in terms of teaching, learning, and quality assurance. We thought that we could bring research and practice to provide examples of cases of good practice, aiming to share with other colleagues the work done in various countries. We wanted to organize a book that reflected a European perspective of teaching and learning that could inform the different stakeholders of the realities of other countries so we can learn from each other. So we didn't want to focus just on a case study or telling a story that happened in Portugal or in England, but we wanted to have this more holistic understanding about what is happening um, in Europe. Therefore, we have 16 chapters from eight countries, and we have now a better insight into the different issues that are presented and discussed in the chapters, and are in a way even more aware of the importance of valuing educational research and good quality teaching and learning. I have to say that we learned a lot by reading the chapters, by interacting with the different authors. So that was really a very valuable experience. And we hope we, you can feel the same when you have the chance to read the book. So thank you so much once again for all the parties involved in organizing this book with us. Um, this was not just an effort from the editors of the book. This was, a, you know, a bigger effort, one that we couldn't have done without you all. Thank you. So now I'm going to introduce um, Professor Leslie Jane because she's she was kindly she kindly accepted to um, present a very brief conference and um, also to present the book for us today. So Leslie Jane has more than 30 years of experience in higher education as an academic and uh, also as a senior manager. 
She started her career as a researcher and academic in immunology at the University of Surrey. But after a few years, she started to lead different academic development centers in England and educational research units. Her focus was to lead innovation in teaching and pedagogical research at the institutional level. Because of this work, she was one of the first national teaching fellows in the UK, was a deputy vice chancellor for education at the London University. And after her retirement, she's now a AG consultant in different countries, working closely with politicians and institutional managers. Thank you once again, Leslie Jane, for accepting this invitation to be here today with us. Thank you, Isabel. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the book, Excellence in Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, Institutional Policies, Research and Practices in Europe, published by Quimbra University Press. I was asked to give a brief talk, um, which might set the scene for this book, and reading through the contributions, a question came to my mind. Are we brave enough to be excellent teachers in this world of performance indicators? We've certainly been brave enough in the last two years facing this dreadful pandemic and all the challenges that it has presented to those of us who have been trying to provide a high quality teaching and learning experience to all of our students. But can we sustain that or will we go back to business as usual? And what is that business? Higher education has changed beyond all recognition in the last two years. But we've had the knowledge and technology to make that difference for many, many years. And yet we failed to make such a step change before. Why was this? I think it is probably that in our lifetimes, Legislation and governments have had more power to influence the higher what higher education is all about, and we have seen the commercialization of higher education beyond all expectations. I thought we could go back a little while and think about when the modern university was first introduced by Humboldt in the 1800s. His idea was that universities should be based on scientific logic, reasoning and research that they should be designed to fulfill the needs of the rapid industrialization our world was seeing at that time. And the foci of such in institutions should be the promotion and application of pure sciences to boost productivity through the modernization of industrial processes. Not that they should become commercially sustainable businesses, which is what we seem to be facing today. We are still highly influenced by the needs of employers with metrics such as employability and final salaries of graduates impacting on a range of lead tables, which in turn affects student choice and the popularity and therefore the success of an institution. Humboldt's ideas were a far cry from the original view of universities being the domain of the wealthy who focused on exploring ideas and theories to advance our knowledge in a range of theoretical fields which piqued their interest. Humboldt did, however, introduce the original concept of widening participation in higher education, although this did not really become a priority until late in the 20th century. But Humboldt did, however, considered that it might result in metrics which influence league tables and consequently student choice and institutional success. In the early 1900s, Dewey, Vygotsky and others linked learning with the quality of thought and the enhancement of culture, widening the sphere of influence of higher education and introducing endless possibilities. Despite this seminal work, change was slow to occur, and it was another crisis that had a lasting impact on higher education. Two devastating world wars led to a shortage of manpower and resulted in a post-war baby boom, which by the 60s presented a challenge to governments and that there were not enough places in universities to meet the demand. This made many governments realize the need to listen to employers to expand higher education provision and to widen access. 
This meant that there was a growing economic dependence on higher education and led to the realization that there was a need to ensure that the provision in one institution was an equivalent standard to that provided in others. Since that time, we have seen the growth of legislation in Europe, and in that I include the UK, through the Bologna process to enhance the quality of higher education and to equalize academic standards across providers. The impact of Bologna was to raise the structure and standards of tertiary education across the European Union and its affiliated countries. And this in turn led to increased mobility of the workforce, a central tenet of the EU. Students were recognized as consumers who were paying ever more for their education and therefore had a right to input into the design and delivery of that education. This led to the concept of student choice and equal opportunities for all. Again, this fed into metrics for students from diverse backgrounds and with learning disabilities and the expectation that institutions should ensure equal success for all. This was also a time of massification of higher education, driven by the economic needs, not only of countries, but also in some instances, the universities themselves, due to changes in the way higher education was funded. And by the rightful expectation of the entitlement to higher education for all. However, with massification comes the challenge of maintaining standards and quality, and this has taxed countries and institutions the world over. Indeed, in many countries, quality codes have been developed with some measure of external agency control to try to raise standards and ensure that all students achieve at least a minimal level of proficiency in their subjects. However, these codes and frameworks are relatively rigid and tend to stifle innovation and the freedom of thought that universities were originally supposed to engender. All these legislative changes influenced institutional strategies with the emphasis focusing on the need for equality of opportunity and for quality in delivery. It was around this time that we started talking about excellence in learning and teaching. It was recognized that many academics entered their careers through success in their research and teaching was something they did because they were experts in their field, not because they were good at teaching. This was when academic development departments started to be established and the idea of teaching academics the theory and skills associated with excellent teaching was promoted. Although even now, we do not have a definitive definition of teaching excellence. Schemes were established, such as the National Teaching Fellowship Scheme in the UK, to recognize those who had an outstanding impact on their students as a result of innovative and creative approaches to teaching. The National Teaching Fellowship Scheme has been running for more than 20 years and in the UK led to the creation of Centres for Excellence in Learning and Teaching which received millions from the British government to try to induce a step change in higher education, learning and teaching. Many other schemes existed worldwide, but in general, they failed to have a lasting profound impact. Perhaps my own experience might help shed some light on why this was. I was one of the first to receive a national teaching fellowship. And at that time, it came with 50,000 pounds to undertake a research project which would enhance teaching and learning. I taught immunology to large classes of students. They also learned physiology and pharmacology in the same semester, none of which they had studied before and all of which they found challenging. Each science comes not only with its own particular concepts, but also with its own language. And so these students who were registered for biochemistry, nutrition, microbiology and nursing degrees, all had to study three new sciences in the same semester and learn their facts as well as their language. Generally, their outcomes were quite poor. 
So in 2001, before the Americans developed the term flipped classroom, I was exploring the benefits of what we then called student-centered learning. I created an interactive online program, which included the curriculum for the semester and covered their module learning outcomes. I also wrote a book for those who are less comfortable studying online. Students had to prepare for their face-to-face -face sections, which were reduced from two hours per week to one hour every two weeks. But instead of being in classes of 150 or 200 students, they were in groups of 10. Each Tuesday, they had a series of short answer exercises to complete for which if they handed them in, they received full formative feedback on the following Thursday. During the face-to-face -face sessions, the students themselves chose the subjects which they had found most challenging. And we had a range of activities in which they engaged, which included them discussing the subject using the language of immunology. At the end of the course, they resubmitted their work, which they'd been allowed to improve as a result of the feedback and had to take a multiple choice questionnaire. All the students passed and performed much better in immunology than in their other two courses and than any students who had studied the course previously. Of course, I was absolutely delighted. Attendance was 100%. However, during this semester, a number of students had raised a petition to the Dean about me, saying that I was making them work too hard. I was called before the Dean and asked for an explanation. He was worried that these students would give me very poor module evaluations and subsequent marks in things like what we now call the National Student Survey would impact the university and the overall outcomes for the faculty and it's standing in national and international league tables. He felt that I was therefore jeopardizing the careers of my colleagues. He expected me, I think, to apologize and stop doing what I was doing, but I didn't feel I could do that since I was making a difference to those students and not only to some, but to all of them equally. So I pointed out to him that it was too late to change things because exams were already set and dates were already agreed and we would have to see what happened. Actually, my course ratings did go down from 4.8 out of 5 to 4.7 out of 5. And the majority of the students subsequently apologised for the petition and acknowledged that they had learned more because they had understood the subject and enjoyed the opportunity to discuss it rather than be force-fed facts. Sadly, however, several colleagues who had considered following my lead failed to do so because they were worried about the impact it might have on the metrics and therefore the league tables and therefore potentially their careers. So the moral of this story is that while we are metrics driven, teaching excellence i.e. the sort of teaching that inspires and encourages students to seek their own truths in their subject area will always be a second consideration. Indeed, in 2016, the UK trialled a teaching excellence framework similar to the research excellence framework. It was designed to try and provide some sort of guidance to students about the quality of the learning experience offered by an institution. The metrics used included a number of questions from the National Student Survey about student satisfaction with teaching and assessment and feedback, as well as measures of student success based on employability and post-graduation salaries and student continuation. After four years, almost, uh, actually in 2019, an independent review was set up uh, of this process. Um, per perhaps the most telling outcomes of this review are a change in the name from teaching excellence framework to educational excellence framework, removing the emphasis on teaching experience since no single definition of such has been agreed. In addition, there is the inclusion of a new category of educational gain 
which will be determined by each institution individually, since projects funded by the British government were unable to propose a single effective non-biased approach to measuring this educational gain provided by a higher education experience. I think this speaks volumes about what we're trying to achieve. If we want to make higher education effective, impactful and exciting, we're not going to do so while we're still governed by institutional metrics and government bodies that base decisions about funding and reputation through those metrics. In conclusion, I think we can say that while standards such as excellence, which we seem unable to define, are determining league table positions and student choice, and we will have to be brave to make changes that we believe will make a difference to higher education and its outcomes. However, I think we're already beginning to see that enough people are brave, enough to make their own voices heard, we can bring about change and hopefully change for the better. Perhaps one day we will return to the model of higher education that provides innovative, creative and far-sighted individuals the opportunities to change the world rather than to contribute to keeping the world as it is through the unquestioning absorption of someone else's perception of the truth. I think the book that we're launching today helps us understand how far we have moved down that route in Europe in particular, and how far we have traveled along similar um, roads, trying to achieve similar outcomes whilst perhaps taking different directions. The book gives some greater analysis of the way in which metrics drive excellence as we currently understand it to be. It also provides examples where people have put their heads above the parapet in order to try and make a difference. It's divided into four sections, policy and quality, professionalization of teaching and academic development, research and teaching nexus, and pedagogy and practice. In the first section, chapter one is a case study in England exploring how university teaching, students and academics are affected by policy clusters. In chapter two, this presents a study in Portugal discussing how open and distance education research and policies are transforming higher education practices, particularly in relation to widening participation. Chapter three describes how teaching is evaluated in Spanish universities. And chapter four explores IQAS and the continuous improvement in the quality of teaching and learning at Quimbra. I think this uh, first section of the book provides a really good overview of policy uh, within certain countries within Europe. In the second section, professionalization of teaching and academic development, Chapter five provides a case study from the University of Lund about rewarding university teaching. We've seen in the UK that this can be highly productive, but as with most things, as funding has decreased, so the financial support for these uh, recognition awards is also decreasing. And in some areas such as the United States, they've disappeared altogether. Chapter six gives an overview of professional development in the UK by discussing providing opportunities for professional learning. And finally, in this section, colleagues from the University College Cork in Ireland describe the 25 year history of their centre for the integration of research, teaching and learning. In the third section of the book, the research and teaching nexus, Chapter eight provides a description of research informed teaching and learning at the University College in Cork in Ireland. By contrast, chapter nine addresses the challenges of academic work where research, teaching and publication are key expectations in research intensive institutions such as Quimbra. Finally, chapter 10 describes the integration of research and education 
at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. In the last section of the book, Pedagogy and Practice, where we see a range of um, contributions from all over Europe, chapter 11 explores ways in which we can promote student agency in higher education from Humboldt to the technology of today, something that we've all learned an awful lot about in the last two years. Chapter 12 looks at the use of uh, the innovative use of blockchain certification to validate individual learning paths through a globally shared teaching experience. And if like me, you weren't familiar with blockchain, this chapter gives you a very good overview of exactly what that is and what advantages it has in relation to uh, technology enhanced learning and assessment. Chapter 13 examines how postgraduate supervision is structured in the UK, whilst chapter 14 explores insights to teaching in higher education from lecturing to case-based methods. Chapter 15 describes learner-centered teaching at the Massiarch University in Bruno. And finally, chapter 16 explores the much used approach of problem-based learning something with which we're probably all very familiar, but there's still plenty to learn. Whilst the editors accept that this is not an exhaustive look at similarities and differences in learning and teaching between the affiliated countries of Europe, it is a starting place for discussions and comparisons, which may eventually help us to really understand what we mean by excellence in teaching in higher education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie Chain. Um, I would like to ask our colleagues from the audience, um, also our uh, the authors of the book, if they have any questions, um, something that they would like to ask Leslie Jane, or just to raise some points for discussion. I will uh, be first. <laughs> I'll ask a question. <laughs> Good. I cannot see. Oh, yes, Marion. Hi. Hi. Um, hi. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was fascinating, uh, your um, contribution. And I, I'm very interested in what you say about, you know, the move from Humboldt and, if you like, us going further and further towards consumerism and the fact that the metrics push us in that way. And... I'm wondering whether you think, I suppose, in the light of the book, but equally in, in the broader picture, that um, we can still return, if you like. I mean, there's Newman versus Humboldt, as it were, as to whether we still have, you know, that higher education is about, if you like, learning for its own sake as well. And um, the same in teaching and learning. And uh, I, I think, as you see, my experience over the years was that despite the um, disciplinary differences, you know, because um, when you're running an academic center, as you know, so many staff come from different um, disciplines, but there was always that feeling, and some of them came, you know, when even there was no kudos for it initially, they just wanted to learn about teaching and learning, but we were always talking about this, about the joy of learning and um, the fact that, you know, of knowledge because it's precious in itself and that, it doesn't have to be measured, but I don't know whether we will ever now um, overcome, you know, are the league tables going to strangle us, as it were, um, in the end, or does the pandemic equally show that innovation thrived in teaching and learning and that a lot of the students discovered a lot about themselves and about new ways of working, so... I suppose that's my, you know, it's more a kind of a comment as well as to what I, I would dread to think that we would be um, down the narrow consumerist road and that we lose really that precious gift of, you know, the, what, what wisdom is, if you like, what learning is. I think that's a really important and interesting observation. Um, I think there are still people out there who teach because they love teaching. Who, who teach their students by 
getting their students to ask questions and to love learning to to uh, spread the joy of of the discipline in which they in, are interested. I think from the perspective of institutions, I think we still see very much that the bottom line is driven by finance. It is consumerist. And I'm not convinced that that's changed. I've I've always I've always believed that when the government in the UK made polytechnics into universities, it was because they felt we had too many universities and that by converting polytechnics into universities, we could actually sideline far more into that delivery of information and facts and getting people to a certain level and leaving a much smaller elite group of institutions where the real innovation, creativity, the excitement, the exploration is actually undertaken because they will always get the investment through their alumni, through business, because of the association with their name. When you look at some of the institutions um, in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same across Europe, we have some very small institutions who are desperately struggling to keep afloat financially. And yet in pockets, they have areas where they are absolutely world leaders. And so I, I fear for the idea that we, we will just become, this is what you need to know to pass your exams and get your degree and you go off and get your job. Um, and I fear the idea that we say no to people. You can't do that because our quality frameworks don't allow it or, you know, our, our university regulations don't allow it. I think we've we've got to learn to be much more flexible whilst maintaining quality, which I don't think can only be maintained through a very rigid structure. Thank you, Marion. Um, any other question or comment? Uh, Hi, Eric. Can I, hello, can I ask a question? Hi. Yes, please, you can. <laughs> Hi, Leslie and Jen, it's been a, a long time, so nice to see you. And you. Yeah, um, so first of all, um, congratulations to, to everybody. Um, uh, it's fun, always fantastic to, to get the book out there. Um, it's real kind of um, achievement, so well done to, to everybody. I know there's a lot, a lot of work involved. Um, but as we know, uh, academia is a bit of a treadmill, and so one thing is done, the next thing starts, and the, you move on, and there's what's in the next publication and the next publication. So it's important to celebrate this, and uh, you know that, that's kind of uh, a good landmark achievement. Uh, so I think it's important for us to, to take time out and celebrate this. Um, but there's always going to be what's next. And I suppose my question then becomes a kind of philosophical question. And the question is really, what is after excellence? Mm. You know, we're world, living in the world of excellence. We're trying to achieve excellence, to be excellent, to be graded as excellent. Um, what do we think is next? What is after excellence? Sorry about that one, big question. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. It's so nice to speak to you again. Um, well, given, as I said earlier, I don't think anyone can actually define what they mean by teaching excellence or, or um, university excellence in quality or giving a, an, a quality performance or a quality programme because they're, they, they aren't definitive. Um, and so knowing what comes next is very difficult because we don't actually know what excellence encompasses or what it is. And I think we really do need to stop and think about what that means. And the big fundamental question for me is, what is higher education all about? If it is what the government says, which is all about employers, don't think we're teaching students the right things because we're not teaching them to be 
self-reliant, we're not teaching them to ask questions, to be critical thinkers, uh, and that's what they want, you know, because they can learn the stuff of the subject uh, while they're working. They don't need to learn that at university. They need to learn how to think for themselves, how to be creative, how to um, identify that they've had an original thought and develop that original thought into something that's useful and effective. Um, and so I, I think while we're being driven by, well, we're not doing what employers want, we're also going, we're not therefore going to be driven by what is it really that the students want? Um, and I think for me, if you're in education, well, you shouldn't be in education. It's a bit like university challenge. I'm sorry to our European friends if you don't get that television program, but it's a, a, a quiz program where universities put forward teams. And in the old days, when it first started, all the students would say, I am reading for a degree in biochemistry. Now they say I'm doing a degree in biochemistry. And that whole difference, that reading, that exploration, that going where it's leading me, exploring what it's about, to me, says everything about higher education and how it's changed. That now we're doing biochemistry or philosophy is oh, I've got these books to read and I've got that exam to pass and then I'm done. And so for me, it, it's, it's got to be about changing our perception of what we mean by higher education and where higher education begins and ends, because actually it shouldn't really end until the day we die. Does that help at all? <laughs> Yes, it, yes, it does. I think, well, what you've done is I, I, I asked about the first word in the title and you, you spoke about the last two. <laughs> <laughs> but but, the, the, but the, thinking, the thinking is the same thing. And, and I think it's important for all, for all of us really to be asking those questions. You know, what is it we're doing? Why are we doing it? Is it for the government? Is it for some external agency? Is it for really for the students? And, and and I'm so glad you brought us back to that. You know, it's, um, really, it's about them and what do they want from higher education. Um, I suppose the difficulty is sometimes they might want something that I don't want from higher education. And they might want the doing of a degree and I might want the, the sort of more reading of a degree. Um, and there might be a sort of mismatch there sometimes between their expectations and my more lofty aspirations. I, I guess that brings us back to my my comment about um, uh, further education colleges who did a brilliant job at delivering further education. And if all a student wants to do is do a degree, I think they should be doing it at further education college. I think if they want to be reading for a subject, they should be doing that at a higher education institution. And that's where the excellence is. That's where the innovation and creativity should be. Thank you, Eric. Any other question? It has been a very good discussion. It's really, I think that just having the time to stop and think about what we mean by um, higher education, what is the purpose of higher education? It's very valuable, and especially nowadays, um, because we change the way we teach, the way we supervise students, the way we do even research. So I think we are at the right time to reflect about our daily practices and what we want to do um, in the near future. That's also important, I think. Okay, so no further questions. I don't see any other questions in, on the Zoom. No further comments? Okay, so I think uh, we can um, end uh, this launch. Um, well, personally, and I think that my colleagues will share my, my view. I think it has been a, a great experience. I wish we could um, be in Coimbra mm -hmm. as we initially thought. Um, it would be lovely 
Um, but uh, as Claudia mentioned in the beginning, I think that um, maybe in the near future, um, we can meet and organize a seminar, um, an institutional event where we have the chance to again meet and discuss about the future of higher education. Um, I will, Professor Claudia, the last words. Yes, so I, I had a lot of questions here, but I said I'm not going to ask. Uh, so to have the opportunity to be to do it here in Coimbra. So thank you again. Thank you, Leslie, um, to be with us. Thank you, all the colleagues. Uh, um, I always have hope of changing. So just uh, last words. I, I always have. Uh, I have hope. Of course, time is is a problem to do everything research and teaching but i have hope that we can mix and you can convince others to 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 increase the, the number of the um, the people that believe that this is the the things that we have to do teaching and uh, the doing research at the same time for sure so i have a hope especially because um, at least for european commission now they are I think that for the first time, the DG education and DG um, research, they are connecting a little bit. So I have hope that we can change a little bit, but at least we can change nearby. So let's contaminate others. And in the end, <laughs> we will contaminate. I think uh, we should contaminate. So uh, it's the, the, the way that we have to do it with enthusiasm. And, and we are sure that you are doing the best way. Uh, so let's continue. So we hope to see, I hope to see you all here in Coimbra and for sure, uh, and I hope a second edition of this book, another, the number two of the book. We have a lot of things to, to write and to discuss. And uh, I will contact some of you uh, privately with a lot of work that we have to do here in, at the University of Coimbra. So we'll keep in touch. For me, it was very useful and thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Fatima. And thank you, Teresa Pessoa for, for putting me this in the, the middle of this very interesting group that I will keep and I will feed. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much for the support and for organizing the event. And bye-bye. I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.